Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Clydman, editor-in-chief of Yahoo News, and we are just moments away from the second and final debate between President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden. We are looking live at the debate stage at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee, where many may be wondering whether we're going to see a spectacle like the last time these two men squared off just a few weeks ago, and Donald Trump tried steamrolling Biden with his combative tone and constant interruptions, one commentator memorably calling it a hot mess inside a dumpster fire inside a train wreck. I'm joined by my colleague, Mike Isikoff, Yahoo News' chief investigative correspondent and my co-host on the Skullduggery podcast, Hunter Walker, uh, chief uh, White House correspondent for Yahoo News, who's been covering the Trump campaign, and Brittany Shepard, national politics reporter who's on the Biden campaign. Guys, welcome. Uh, let me start with you, Isikoff. Uh, all the polling suggests that the last debate was nothing short of a catastrophe for Trump. He is down by double digits in most national polls and trailing Biden in just about all the key battleground states. We've got 12 days to go before the election, and 40 million Americans have already voted. What does he need to do tonight? In indeed, what can he do tonight to change the trajectory of this race? Well, I, you know, he needs to change the narrative. It's very clear. Uh, he is behind. Um, he's behind decisively in the national polls. Uh, nothing that uh, he's done so far has worked or uh, gotten traction with the electorate. And this is his last chance. Um, so it's a tough haul. Now, I should point out that the uh, it, while he's pretty decisively behind in the national polls, uh, some of those uh, some of the polls in the in the key battleground states are pretty close, or he's within striking distance. So if he can succeed, um, you know, he's got an outside shot. I think there's two issues to look for in this debate um, from the Biden camp. It's the coronavirus. I was just looking just before we went on. 71,000 new cases today reported nationally, uh, including in some pretty key states, more than 6,000 in Texas, which the polls show is surprisingly is pretty close. Uh, in uh, in North Carolina, 2,400 new, case, new cases. Those are very bad numbers for the president. But on the president, what we can look for, and I think everybody is looking for at this point, is how forcefully d does he go after this Hunter Biden email story? It's gained a lot of traction in conservative media. We had one of Hunter Biden's former uh, business partners stepping forward just in the last day saying, yes, these emails are authentic. Authentic. They're not Russian disinformation, and the references to the big guy in the in the emails is indeed uh, Joe Biden. So that gives the president something to work with. How does uh, B Biden respond to what inevitably Trump is going to bring up? Is something we're all going to be looking for. Okay, Hunter. So uh, we've been hearing a couple of different things from the uh, uh, Trump campaign. One is that. Uh, he came in too hot last time. I think the American people saw that. Um, and so he's he's going to kind of tone things down a bit, maybe, uh, and uh, let Joe Biden do more talking. Maybe he'll hang himself with his own words. Uh, on the other hand, he's going to be on the attack uh, on all of the issues that uh, Isikoff just referenced, uh, particularly uh, Hunter Biden's business dealings. It, that is a fine line to walk. Uh, Tell us uh, what you think Trump is going to do tonight and how well he'll be able to execute. What I think Trump is going to do, I mean, I, I never <laughs> want to be in the position of trying to predict what Donald Trump is going to do. But uh, I think one thing is certain, and you're right, that Joe Biden is going to have more of a chance to talk here. Uh, and that's in part because the Commission on Presidential Debates has installed a, a bit of a mute button where uh, the candidates are going to be allowed to make two minutes of remarks without interruption. And, you know, that's widely seen as a move to stop President Trump from just steamrolling over the moderator, steamrolling over Joe Biden, as he did in that first debate. Trump's response to that has been kind of let Joe Biden talk. He always hangs himself. But really, I think it actually could be good for President Trump, uh, because as, as you guys pointed out, the feedback on his um, interrupting in that first debate was just dismal. Uh, the other thing that we've seen from him is complaining about the CPD, complaining about the debate rules, complaining about the topics, complaining about the moderator, uh, all of this working the rep. 
And I think that is part of a larger strategy, where, as Mike was outlining, President Trump's in trouble. He needs to do something big here. Uh, his people always talk about him as a counterpuncher, and he's at his best when he has his back against the wall. What we've also seen is that when he has his back against the wall, he's willing to use unconventional warfare. He's willing to work the refs, as he has done. He's willing to throw things out like, you know, Rudy Giuliani with this uh, questionable laptop of Hunter Biden emails. And as Mike mentioned, we also saw this is the Tony Bobolinsky debate. Uh, President Trump brought this guy who was a business partner of Hunter Biden with him to the debate, had him speak to reporters beforehand, and he's definitely going to want to lean in to this controversy that he's been trying to promote uh, about Biden's family. So Bobolinsky may become a household name. <laughs> Seems <laughs> unlikely to me. We'll see. All right. L l let's bring in uh, Brittany. Um, uh, Brittany, uh, Biden has been hunkered down over the last few days uh, uh, doing debate prep. Uh, he's had... Uh, you know, mega wattage uh, uh, surrogates out there for him, in particular uh, Barack Obama. He has run a conservative campaign all along. Uh, coming into this debate, uh, it seems to me he just needs to get through it. What is his strategy, and how do you think he is going to uh, respond to the attacks that uh, he knows are coming from uh, uh, Donald Trump on his family? Well, Dan, just get through it essentially is what Biden wants to do. Ever since the beginning of the primary, Joe Biden um, strategist has been telling him, honestly, don't make news. Just kind of sit there and let everyone else around you uh, punch themselves until you're the last one standing. We've been seeing him do this with Trump in the first debate. He barely spoke and kind of stood there as Trump hung himself, as Hunter and Mike were saying. And I think we're going to see that again today. His advisors know that Biden gets hot under the collar when his son um, is mentioned, whether it's Hunter or uh, his son who has passed Bo Biden. And when Joe Biden begins to fly off the handle, he goes off course and he begins to ramble. He begins to become um, a, a pawn of Donald Trump's tactics that the campaign just doesn't even want to play in that sandbox. We have an idea of how he might respond. About an hour ago, the Trump, uh, the Biden campaign released a statement about uh, Tony Bobolinsky and um, this Hunter Biden email. I'd like to read the last line. It's a bit lengthy, but um, the Biden campaign calls Donald Trump bringing Hunter Biden's ex business associate a desperate, pathetic farce executed by flailing campaign with no rationale for putting our country through another four years of hell. We have not heard a full-throated condemnation of the New York Post Hunter Biden laptop story like this from the Biden campaign before. Honestly, Joe Biden is known as kind of this conservative Democrat down the middle, not trying to ruffle any feathers. If anything, you're going to see a more angered, more pointed Biden today, someone who kind of has that juice that Obama has and that Critics from both sides say that Joe Biden is lacking. So um, if the statement earlier is of any indication, Joe Biden's not going to hold back, but his campaign really wants him to focus on the president's bungling of the coronavirus um, pandemic response and how he could course correct if he's elected in just two weeks. Let me just follow up with you on one thing, because the, the one area of criticism uh, that uh, Biden has gotten consistently, going back to the last uh, debate, the last town hall, uh, is this whole question of expanding the court or packing the court as, as, as it is uh, described more pejoratively. Now, he just put out, uh, a, uh, in, in, in his uh, 60 Minutes interview, he said that uh, he was going to appoint a kind of blue ribbon uh, panel of constitutional scholars to study the question. Uh, is he going to say any more about it, or is that basically uh, sort of the they put a pin in it? That's all they're going to do, and that and they think that they can uh, they can continue through the election without saying any more about this. Well, yeah, they're certainly going to try to dodge this question as much as possible. So, yeah, this uh, clip from the upcoming 60 Minutes interview Biden did with Nora O'Donnell came out. Joe Biden said that court packing is a live ball. He would not come down and give an exact answer on whether he's pro or against it during the primary. He said that he's something that he's not looking into doing, but instead he wants to get a bipartisan um, committee together to study it 
Of course, that's pretty much a non-answer, right? Um, he's not committing either way. He doesn't even want to get into that political argument because him and his circuits are saying it's a distraction from more important things like coronavirus or health care or unemployment. He did kind of promise during the last town hall that he would give a more definitive answer during election day. But like you said, 40 million people have already voted. It's election season. It's past election day for many people. So if he can right. fly under which, the radar with this one, I think which, he's going to keep doing it. Which raises the question, of course, whether a debate like this, after so many people have voted, after so many people have made their minds up, there are so few undecided voters left, is actually going to make any difference um, you know, it's certainly going to be uh, thrilling to watch because these debates are, uh, but it'll be interesting to see whether whether it will, you know, have have real impact. Mike, your thoughts? Well, you're right. I mean, uh, tens of millions of people have already voted, uh, and that's uh, an extraordinary. Uh, the, the numbers are extraordinary on the early voting. Uh, but you know, look clearly, there's plenty of people who haven't. Um, I do think that uh, there are some risks for the Biden camp here uh, on the Hunter Biden story. Uh, the, I think the full statement that um, Brittany was referring to also doubles down on the idea that this is Russian disinformation. But now that we have a real live guy, Tony Bobolinsky, who was a business partner uh, with Hunter Biden in his business dealings with China, and he is he's going to uh, he's going to be interviewed by Senate Homeland security tomorrow. I wouldn't be surprised if they bring him uh, forward as a witness, a public witness next week. Uh, and, um, you know, if this is Russian disinformation, the Biden camp is going to have to show that Bobolinsky, a, a retired naval officer uh, who has uh, contributed to Democrats in the past, is somehow a part of this Russian operation. Uh, and that could be a little difficult. Um, look, I think there's a better response for the Biden folks, and that is to point to Donald Trump's business dealings. We just had uh, the uh, story from the New York Times the other day that Trump tried to, tried to himself to do business in Russia, in China, and even had a bank account in China. I think that's a better response for Biden than to try to make the argument that it's and all Russian disinformation, saw, because the fact is course, we just right. don't know. And of course, we saw Pete Buttigieg, uh, who is one of become one of uh, Biden's most effective surrogates, making exactly that point on Fox News uh, earlier today. It went viral, so I, I'm, I think you're probably right. We're probably going to hear that retort from from Biden. Hunter, um, the Trump campaign may feel um, a little bit energized uh, by this um, Hunter Biden story. Um, but what is the mood really like inside uh, Trump world um, as uh, as uh, the president gets ready to debate? How are they feeling about how things are going? So I've been on press calls with the Trump campaign leadership. I was on Air Force One where they were sort of strategizing in a little conference room together on, on Tuesday after the president's rally. Um, they all seem very upbeat. Uh, they're insisting they're very confident. Uh, in light of the polls that we actually have seen, I, I can't help but feel like uh, Trump campaign manager Bill Stepien has taken on a bit of a Baghdad Bob air as he sits there and says, I've never felt better than about the numbers. I've never been more confident than I am now. Uh, that comes right after I even had people in the president's inner circle suggest that uh, for the first time in my conversations with them, they thought he was going to lose. That being said, this Hunter Biden story, a little bit of tightening in Pennsylvania. Oh, oh, okay, Hunter, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Hunter, I'm gonna cut you off here because we're about to start the debate. Uh, the the uh, debate. Christian Welker uh, is getting ready, uh, and uh, the candidates uh, uh, will be on shortly. Um, so let's uh, wait for the debate to start. We will be back uh, for analysis and commentary right after the debate. So stay with us on Yahoo News. President Joe Biden and President Donald J. Trump. And I do want to say a very good evening to both of you. This debate will cover six 
major topics. At the beginning of each section, each candidate will have two minutes uninterrupted to answer my first question. The debate commission will then turn on their microphone only when it is their turn to answer, and the commission will turn it off exactly when the two minutes have expired. After that, both microphones will remain on, but on behalf of the voters, I'm going to ask you to please speak one at a time. The goal is for you to hear each other and for the American people to hear every word of what you both have to say. And so with that, if you're ready, let's start. And we will begin with the fight against the coronavirus. President Trump, the first question is for you. The country is heading into a dangerous new phase. More than 40,000 Americans are in the hospital tonight with COVID, including record numbers here in Tennessee. And since the two of you last shared a stage, 16,000 Americans have died from COVID. So please be specific. How would you lead the country during this next stage of the coronavirus crisis? Two minutes uninterrupted. So as you know, 2.2 million people modeled out were expected to die. We closed up the greatest economy in the world in order to fight this horrible disease that came from China. It's a worldwide pandemic. It's all over the world. You see the spikes in Europe and many other places right now. Uh, if you notice, the mortality rate is down 85 percent. Uh, the excess mortality rate is way down and much lower than almost any other country. And we're fighting it and we're fighting it hard. There is a spike. There was a spike in Florida and it's now gone. There was a very big spike in Texas. It's now gone. There was a very big spike in Arizona. It's now gone. And there are some spikes and surges in other places. They will soon be gone. We have a vaccine that's coming. It's ready. It's going to be announced within weeks, and it's going to be delivered. We have uh, Operation Warp Speed, which is the military is going to distribute the vaccine. I can tell you from personal experience that uh, I was in the hospital. I had it. And I got better, and I will tell you that uh, I had something that they gave me, a therapeutic, I guess they would call it. Some people could say it was a cure. But uh, I was in for a short period of time, and I got better very fast, or I wouldn't be here tonight. And now they say I'm immune. Whether it's four months or a lifetime, nobody's been able to say that, but I'm immune. Uh, more and more people are uh, getting better. We have uh, a problem that's a worldwide problem. This is a worldwide problem. But I've been congratulated by the heads of many countries on what we've been able to do. Uh, with the, if you, if you take a look at what we've done in terms of goggles and masks and gowns and everything else, and in particular ventilators, we're now making ventilators all over the world, thousands and thousands a month, distributing them all over the world. It will go away, and as I say, we're rounding the turn, we're rounding the corner. It's going away. Okay, former Vice President Biden, to you, how would you lead the country out of this crisis? You have two minutes uninterrupted. 220,000 Americans dead. If you hear nothing else I say tonight, hear this. Anyone who's responsible for not taking control, in fact, not saying I'm, I take no responsibility initially, anyone who's responsible for that many deaths should not remain as President of the United States of America. We're in a situation where there are a thousand deaths a day now, a thousand deaths a day. And there are over 70,000 new cases per day. Compared to what's going on in Europe, as the New England Medical Journal said, they're starting from a very low rate. We're starting from a very high rate. The expectation is we'll have another 200,000 Americans dead between now and the end of the year. If we just wore these masks, the president's own advisors have told him, we could save 100,000 lives. And we're in a circumstance where the president thus far and still has no plan, no comprehensive plan. What I would do is make sure we have everyone encouraged to wear a mask all the time. I would make sure we move in the direction of rapid testing, investing in rapid testing. I would make sure that we set up national standards as to how to open up schools and open up businesses so they can be safe and give them the wherewithal, the financial resources to be able to do that. We're in a situation now where the New England Medical Journal, one of the serious, most serious journals in the, in the whole world, said for the first time ever that this, the way this president has responded to this crisis has been absolutely tragic. And so, folks, I will take care of this. I will end this. I will make sure we have a plan. 
President Trump, I'd like to follow up with you and your comments. You talked about taking a therapeutic. I assume you're referencing Regeneron. You also said a vaccine will be coming within weeks. Yes. Is that a guarantee? Is, no, it's is not this... a guarantee, but it will be by the end of the year. But I think it has a good chance. There are two companies, I think, within a matter of weeks, and it will be distributed very quickly. Can you tell us which companies? Uh, Johnson & Johnson is doing very well. Moderna is doing very well. Pfizer is doing very well. And we have numerous others. And then we also have others that we're working on very closely with other countries, in particular Europe. Let me follow up with you, and because this is new information, you have said a vaccine is coming soon within weeks now. Your own officials say it could take well into 2021 at the earliest for enough Americans to get vaccinated. And even then, they say the country will be wearing masks and distancing into 2022. Is your timeline realistic? No, I think my timeline is going to be more accurate. I don't know that they're counting on the military the way I do, but we have our generals lined up, one in particular, that's the head of logistics. And this is a very easy distribution for him. He's ready to go as soon as we have the vaccine. And we expect to have 100 million vials. As soon as we have the vaccine, he's ready to go. Vice President Biden, your reaction, and just 40 percent of Americans say they would definitely agree to take a coronavirus vaccine if it was approved by the government. What steps would you take to give Americans confidence in a vaccine if it were approved? Make sure it's totally transparent. Have the scientists of the world see it, know it, look at it, go through all the processes. And by the way, He's, this is the same fellow who told you this is going to end by Easter last time. This is the same fellow who told you that, don't worry, we're going to end this by the summer. We're about to go into a dark winter, a dark winter. And he has no clear plan, and there's no prospect that there's going to be a vaccine available for the majority of the American people before the middle of next year. President Trump, your reaction, he says you have no plan. I don't think we're going to have a dark winter and, at all. We're opening up our country. We've learned and studied and understand the disease, which we didn't at the beginning. When I closed and banned China from coming in heavily infected and then ultimately Europe, but China was in January. Months later, he was saying I was xenophobic. I did it too soon. Now he's saying, oh, I should have, uh, I should have you know, moved quicker. But he didn't move quicker. He was months behind me, many months behind me. And frankly, he ran the H1N1 swine flu, and it was a total disaster, far less lethal, but it was a total disaster. Had that had this kind of numbers, 700,000 people would be dead right now, but it was a far less lethal disease. Uh, look, his own person who ran that for him, who, as you know, was his uh, chief of staff, said, it was catastrophic. It was horrible. We didn't know what we were doing. Now he comes up and he tells us how to do this. Also, everything that he said about the way every single move that he said we should make, that's what we've done. We've done all of it. But he was way behind us. Vice President Biden, your response? My response is he is xenophobic, but not because he shut down access from China. And he did it late after 40 countries had already done that. In addition to that, what he did, he made sure that we had 44 people that were in there in China, trying to get to Wuhan to determine what exactly the source was. What did the president say in January? He said, no, he said, this is, he's being transparent. The president of China is being transparent. We owe him a debt of gratitude. We, ought to, we have to thank him. And, and then what happened was, we started talking about using the Defense Act to make sure we go out and get whatever is needed out there to protect people. And again, I go back to this. He had nothing. He did virtually nothing. And then he gets out of the hospital and he talks about where this is. Oh, don't worry. It's all going to be over soon. Come on. There's not another serious scientist in the world who thinks it's going to be over soon. President Trump, your reaction? I say over soon. I say we're learning to live with it. We have no choice. We can't lock ourselves up in a basement like Joe does. He has the, <laughs> he has the ability to lock himself up. I don't know. He's obviously made a lot of money someplace. But he has this thing about living in a basement. People can't do that. By the way, I, as the president, couldn't do that. I'd love to put myself in the basement or in a beautiful room in the White House and go away for a year and a half until it disappears. I can't do that. And, Kirsten, every, t every meeting I had, every meeting I had, and I'd meet a lot of families, including Gold Star families and military families, every meeting I had, and I had to meet them. I had to. It would be horrible to have canceled everything. I said, you know, this is dangerous. And you catch it. And, you know, I caught it. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Great doctors, great hospitals. And now I recovered. 
of young people recover. 99% of people recover. We have to recover. We can't close up our nation. We have to open our school, and we can't close up our nation, or you're not going to have a nation. And of course, the CDC has said young people can get sick with COVID-19 and can pass it. Vice President Biden, I want to talk broadly about strategy, though. You can have I seen... respond to that? 30 seconds, please, and then seconds. I have a question. No, number one, he says that we're, uh, you know, we're learning to live with it. People are learning to die with it. You folks home will have an empty chair at the kitchen table this morning. That man or wife going to bed tonight and reaching over to try to touch their out of habit where their wife or husband was is gone. Learning to live with it. Come on. We're dying with it because he has never said, he said, you said it's dangerous. When's the last time? Is it really dangerous still? Are we dangerous? You tell the people it's dangerous now? What should they do about the danger? And you say, I take no responsibility. Let me talk about your two. Excuse me, I take, Very full, I take full responsibility. It's not my fault that he came here. It's China's fault. And you know what? It's not Joe's fault that he came here either. It's China's fault. They kept it from going into the rest of China for the most part, but they didn't keep it from coming out to the world, including Europe and ourselves. Vice President Biden. The fact is that when we knew it was coming, when it hit, what happened? What did the president say? He said, don't worry, it's going to go away. Be gone by Easter. Don't worry. The warm weather. Don't worry. Maybe inject bleach. He said he was kidding when he said that. But a lot of people thought it was serious. A whole range of things the president has said. Even today, he thinks we are in control. We're about to lose 200,000 more people. President Trump. Look, perhaps just to finish this, uh, I was kidding on that. But just to finish this, uh, when I closed, he said I shouldn't have closed. And that went on for months. What Nancy Pelosi said the same thing. She was dancing on the streets in Chinatown in San Francisco. But when I closed, he said, this is a terrible thing, you xenophobic. I think he called me racist even. And because I was closing it to China. Now he says I should have closed it earlier. It just, Joe, it doesn't work. I didn't say either of those things. You certainly did. You certainly did. did. I talked about a xenophobia in a different context. It wasn't about closing the border to Chinese coming to the United States. All right, I want to talk about both of your different strategies to handle. this. He thought this. I shouldn't have closed the border. Well, let's... That's obvious. Is that... Do you want to respond to that quickly, Vice President no. Biden? Okay. Let's talk about your different strategies toward dealing with this. Mr. Vice President, you suggested you would support new shutdowns if scientists recommended it. What do you say to Americans who are fearful that the cost of shutdowns, the impact on the economy, the higher rates of hunger, depression, domestic and substance abuse outweighs the risk of exposure to the virus? What I would say is I'm going to shut down the virus, not the country. It's his ineptitude that caused the, vi caused the country to have to shut down in large part. Why businesses have gone under, why schools are closed, why so many people have lost their living, and why they're concerned. Those other concerns are real. That's why he should have been, instead of in a sand trap in his golf course, he should have been negotiating with Nancy Pelosi and the rest of the Democrats and Republicans about what to do about the acts they were passing for billions of dollars to make sure people had the capacity. But you haven't ruled out more shutdowns. Well, no, I, I'm not shutting down the name, but there are, look, you need standards. The standard is if you have a reproduction rate in a community that's above a certain level, everybody says, slow up, more social distancing, do not open bars and do not open gymnasiums, do not open until you get this under control, under more control. But when you do open, give the people the capacity to be able to open and have the capacity to do it safely. For example, schools. Schools, they need a lot of money to be open. They need to deal with ventilation systems. They need to deal with smaller classes, more teachers, more pods. And he's refused to support that money, or at least up to now. Let's talk about schools. President well, Trump, I, I think you... we have to respond, if I might. Please, and then I have a follow-up. Thank you, and I appreciate that. Look, all he does is talk about shutdowns, but forget about him. His Democrat governors, Cuomo in New York, you look at what's going on in California, you look at Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Democrats, Democrats all, they're shut down so tight and they're dying. They're dying. And he supports all these people. All he talks about is shutdowns. No, we're not going to shut down and we have to open our schools. And it's like, as an example, I have a young son. He also tested positive. By the time I spoke to the doctor the second time, he was fine. It just went away. Young people, 
I guess it's their immune system. Let me follow up with you, President Trump. You've demanded schools open in person and insist they can do it safely. But just yesterday, Boston became the latest city to move its public school system entirely online after a coronavirus spike. What is your message to parents who worry that sending their children to school will endanger not only their kids, but also their teachers and okay. families? I want to open the schools. Uh, the transmittal rate to the teachers is uh, very small. But I want to open the schools. We have to open our country. We're not going to have a country. You can't do this. We can't keep this country closed. This is a massive country with a massive economy. People are losing their jobs. They're committing suicide. There's depression, alcohol, drugs at a level that nobody's ever seen before. There's abuse, tremendous abuse. We have to open our country. You know, I've said it often. The cure cannot be worse than the problem itself. Vice and that's President. what's happening. And he wants to close down. He'll close down the country if one person in our in our massive bureaucracy says we should close it down. Vice President Biden, your Simply response. Simply not true. We ought to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We ought to be able to safely open. But would they need resources to open? You need to be able to, for example, if you're going to open a business, have social distancing within the business. You need to have, if you have a restaurant, you need to have plexiglass dividers so people cannot infect one another. You need to be in a position where you can take testing rapidly and know whether a person is, in fact, infected. You need to be able to trace. You need to be able to provide the, all the resources that are needed to do this. And that is not inconsistent with saying that what we're going to make sure that we open safely. And by the way, all you teachers out there, not that many of you are going to die, so don't worry about it. So don't worry about it. Come on. President Trump, let me follow up with you quickly. By the way, um, I will say this. If you go and look at what's happened to New York, it's a ghost town. It's a ghost town. And when you talk about plexiglass, these are restaurants that are dying. These are businesses with no money. Putting up plexiglass is unbelievably expensive, and it's not the answer. I mean, you're going to sit there in a cubicle wrapped around with plastic. It's, these are businesses that are dying, Joe. You can't do that to people. You Which just you can't. Can. Take a look at New York and what's happened to my wonderful city for, for so many years. I loved it. It was vibrant. It's dying. Everyone's leaving New York. Take a look Vice at what President New Biden. York has done in terms of turning the curve down in terms of the number of people dying. And I don't look at this in terms of the way he does. Blue states and red states. They're all the United States. And look at the states that are having such a spike in the coronavirus. They're the red states. They're the states in the Midwest. They're the states in the upper Midwest. That's where the spike is occurring significantly. But they're all Americans. They're all Americans. And what we have to do is say, wear these masks, number one, make sure we get the help that the businesses need that has money's already been passed to do that. It's been out there since the beginning of the summer, and nothing's happened. President, New York has lost more than 40,000 people, 11,000 people in nursing homes. President Trump, what when about— When you say spike, take a look at what's happening in Pennsylvania, where they've had it closed. Take a look at what's happening with your friend in Michigan, where her husband's the only one allowed to do anything. It's been like a prison. Now it was just ruled unconstitutional. Take a look at North Carolina. They're having spikes, and they've been closed. And they're getting killed financially. We can't let that happen, Joe. You can't let that happen. We have to open up. And we understand the disease. We have to protect our seniors. We have to protect our elderly. We have to protect especially our seniors with heart problems and diabetes problems. And we will protect them. We have the best testing in the world by far. That's why we have so many cases. Let me follow up with you jokes. before we move on to our next section. President Trump, this week you called Dr. Anthony Fauci, the nation's best known infectious disease expert, quote, a disaster. You described him and other medical experts as, quote, idiots. If you're not listening to them, who are you listening to as you fight me, this? I'm listening to all of them, including Anthony. I get along very well with Anthony. But he did say, don't wear masks. He did say, as you know, this is not going to be a problem. Uh, I think he's a Democrat, but that's okay. He said, this is not going to be a problem. We are not going to have a problem at all. When Joe says that I said, Anthony Fauci said, and others, and many others, and I'm not knocking him a lot. Nobody knew. Look, nobody knew what this thing was. Nobody knew where it was coming from, what it was. We've learned a lot. But Anthony said, don't wear masks. Now he wants to wear masks. Anthony also said, if you look back, exact words. Here's his exact words. This is no problem. This is going to go away soon. So he's allowed to make mistakes. He happens to be a good person. 
Vice President right. Biden, your response quickly, and then we're going to move on to the next section. My response is that think about what the president knew in January and didn't tell the American people. He was told this was a serious virus that spread in the air, and it was much worse than, much worse than the flu. He went on record and said to one of your colleagues, recorded, that in fact he knew how dangerous it was, but he didn't want to tell us. He didn't want to tell us because he didn't want us to panic. He didn't want us, Americans don't panic. He panicked. But guess what? In the meantime, we find out in the New York Times the other day that, in fact, his folks went to Wall Street and said this is a really dangerous thing. And a memo out of that meeting, not from his administration, but from some of the brokers, said sell short because we've got to get moving. It's a dangerous problem. Well, this is I'm going to give you 30 seconds to respond, and then we're the going to move one, on. I don't know. Somebody went to Wall Street. You're the one that takes all the money from Wall Street. I don't take it. Joe, I have. You, you have raised a lot of money, tremendous amounts of money. And every time you raise money, deals are made, Joe. I could raise so much more money as president and as somebody that knows most of those people. I could call the heads of Wall Street, the heads of every company in America. I would blow away every record, but I don't want to do that because it puts me in a bad position. And then you bring up Wall Street. You shouldn't be bringing up Wall Street because you're the one that takes the money from Wall Street, not me. I could, I could blow away your records that like you wouldn't believe. We don't need money. We have plenty of money. In fact, we beat Hillary Clinton with a tiny fraction of the money that she was able to. All right, to gentlemen, we're going to move on. Don't tell me about Average we're contribution, gonna... $43. All right, we're going to move on to our next section, which is national security. And I do want to start with the security of our elections and some breaking news from overnight. Just last night, top intelligence officials confirmed again that both Russia and Iran are working to influence this election. Both countries have obtained U.S. voter registration information, these officials say, and Iran sent intimidating messages to Florida voters. This question goes to you, Mr. Vice President. What would you do to put an end to this threat? You have two minutes uninterrupted. I made it clear, and I ask everyone else to take the pledge, I made it clear that any country, no matter who it is, that interferes in American elections will pay a price. They will pay a price. And it's been overwhelmingly clear this election, I won't even get into the last one, this election, that Russia has been involved, China has been involved to some degree, and now we learn that, that, uh, that uh, Iran is involved. They will pay a price if I'm elected. They're interfering with American sovereignty. That's what's going on right now. They're interfering with American sovereignty. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't think the president said anything to Putin about it. I don't think he's stalking them a lot. I don't think he said a word. I don't know why he hadn't said a word to Putin about it. And I don't know what he has recently said, if anything, to the Iranians. My guess is he'd probably be more outspoken with regard to the Iranians. But the point is this, folks. We are in a situation where we have foreign company countries trying to interfere in the outcome of our election. His own, own national security advisor told him that what is happening with his buddy — well, I won't — I shouldn't — well, I will. His buddy, Rudy Giuliani, he's being used as a Russian pawn. He's being fed information that is Russian, that is not true. And then what happens? Nothing happens. And then you find out that everything that's going on here about Russia is wanting to make sure that I do not get elected the next president of the United States because they know I know them and they know me. I don't understand why this president is unwilling to take on Putin when he's actually paying bounties to kill American soldiers in Afghanistan, when he's engaged in activities that are trying to destabilize all of NATO. I don't know why he doesn't do it, but it's worth asking the question, why isn't that being done? Any country that interferes with us will, in fact, pay a price because they're affecting our sovereignty. President Trump. Same question to you. To let, me a, let me ask the yes. question. You're going to have two minutes yeah. to respond. For two elections in a row now, there has been substantial interference from foreign adversaries. What would you do in your next term to put an end to this? Two minutes uninterrupted. Well, let me respond to the first part, as Joe answered. Joe got $3.5 million from Russia, and it came through Putin because he was very friendly with the former mayor of Moscow, and it was the mayor of Moscow's wife. And you got $3.5 million. Your family got $3.5 million. And you know, someday you're going to have to explain why did you get three and a half. I never got any money from Russia. I don't get money from Russia. Now, about your thing last night, I knew all about that. And through John, who is John Retliff, who is fantastic, DNI, he said the one thing that's common to both of them, they both want you to lose because there has been nobody tougher to Russia with, between the sanctions, nobody tougher than me on Russia. 
between the sanctions, between all of what I've done with NATO. You know, I've got the NATO countries to put up an extra $130 billion, going to $420 billion a year. That's to guard against Russia. I sold, while he was selling pillows and sheets, I sold tank busters to Ukraine. There has been nobody tougher than, on Russia than Donald Trump. And I'll tell you, they were so bad. They took over the, the submarine port. You remember that very well. During your term, during you and Barack Obama, they took over a big part of what should have been Ukraine. You handed it to them. But you were getting a lot of money from Russia. They were paying you a lot of money, and they probably still are. But now, with what came out today, it's even worse. All of the emails, the emails, the horrible emails of the kind of money that you were raking in, you and your family. And Joe, you were vice president when some of this was happening, and it should have never happened. And I think you owe an explanation to the American people. Why is it? Somebody just had a news conference a little while ago who was essentially supposed to work with you and your family. But what he said was damning. And regardless of me, I think you have to clean it up and talk to the American people. Maybe you can do it right now. Vice President Biden, you may respond. And then I do I, want to follow up on the election security. I have not taken a penny from any foreign source ever in my life. We learned that this president paid 50 times the tax in China, has a secret bank account with China, does business in China, and in fact is talking about me taking money. I have not taken a single penny from any country whatsoever, ever, number one. Number two, this is a president, I have released all of my tax returns, 22 years, go look at them, 22 years of my tax return. You have not released a single solitary year of your tax return. What are you hiding? Why are you unwilling? The foreign countries are paying you a lot. Russia's paying you a lot. China's paying you a lot. And your hotels and all your businesses all around the country, all around the world. And China's building a new road to a new ga a, a, a golf course you have overseas. So what's going on here? Why don't release your tax return or stop talking about corruption? President Trump, your response. First of all, I called my accountants, underwrote it. I'm going to release them as soon as we can. I want to do it. And it'll show how successful, how great this company is. But much more importantly than that, people were saying $750. I asked them a week ago, I said, what did I pay? They said, sir, you prepaid tens of millions of dollars. I prepaid my tax. Tens over the last number of years. Tens of millions of dollars I prepaid. Because at some point they think it's an estimate. They think I may have to pay tax. So I already prepaid it. Nobody told me that. Did your account Nobody tell told you, you that. You Excuse them? me. And it wasn't written. Whenever they write this, they keep talking about $750, which I think is a filing fee. But let me just tell you, I prepaid millions and millions of dollars in taxes, number one. Number two, I don't make money from China. You do. I don't make money from Ukraine. You do. I don't make money from Russia. You made three and a half million dollars, Joe, and your son gave you. They even have a statement that we have to give 10 percent to the big man. You're the big man, I think. I don't know. Maybe you're not. But you're the big man, I think. Your son said we have to give 10 percent to the big man. Joe, what's that all about? It's terrible. All right, gentlemen, I want to ask you both some questions about all of this. To but that. I'm going to let you both respond very quickly. You just said you spoke to your accountant yes. about potentially releasing your taxes. Did he tell you when you can release them? Do you as have a the deadline for when you're going to release them? I to get the treated people? worse than the Tea Party got treated because I have a lot have of people in there. Okay. Deep down in the IRS, they treat me horribly. We made a deal, it was all settled until I decide to run for president. I get treated very badly by the IRS, very unfairly. But we had a deal all done. As soon as we're completed with the deal, I want to release it. But I have paid millions and millions of dollars, and I, it's worse than paying. I paid in advance. It's called prepaying your taxes. Okay. I paid in advance. I want to ask you yep. both about questions regarding your potential foreign entanglements and questions that have been raised to give you both a chance Some to talk about this more this. broadly. Respond very quickly, and then I'll get to my question. Why did he, he's been saying this for four years? Show us. Just show us. Stop playing around. You've been saying for four Everybody years you're going to release your taxes. Nobody knows it, Mr. President. What they do okay. know is you're not paying your taxes or you're paying taxes that are so low. When last time he said what he paid, he said, I only pay that little because I'm smart. I know how to game the system. Come on. 
Come on, folks. So, President Trump, and then I want to get to two questions to both of you sure. on this. I was put through a phony witch hunt for three years. It started before I even got elected. They spied on my campaign. No president should ever have to go through what I went through. Let me just say this. Mueller and 18 angry Democrats and FBI agents all over the place spent $48 million. They went through everything I had, including my tax returns, and they found absolutely no collusion and nothing wrong. Forty-eight million. I guarantee you, if I spent one million on you, Joe, I could find plenty wrong. Because right. the kind of things that you've done and the kind of monies that your family has taken, I mean, your brother made money in Iraq. Me millions of dollars. Your other bro brother made a fortune. And it's all through you, Joe. And they say you get some of it. And you do live very well. You have houses all over the place. You live very well. <laughs> all right, gentlemen, let me just ask oh, some man. questions about all of this broadly. Vice President Biden, there have been questions about the work your son has done in China and for a Ukrainian energy company when you were vice president. In retrospect, was anything about those relationships inappropriate or unethical? Nothing was unethical. Here's what the deal. With regard to Ukraine, we had this whole question about whether or not, because he was on the board, I later learned of a Burisma, a company, that somehow I had done something wrong. Yet every single solitary person when he was going through his impeachment, testifying under oath who worked for him, said, I did my job impeccably. I carried out U.S. policy. Not one single solitary thing was out of line. Not a single thing, number one. Number two, the guy who got in trouble in Ukraine was this guy trying to bribe the Ukrainian government to say something negative about me, which they would not do and did not do because it never, ever, ever happened. My son has not made money in terms of this thing about, uh, what are you talking about, China. I have not had, a, the only guy made money from China is this guy. He's the only one. Nobody else has made money from China. Never President deal, Trump, deal with let me, let me ask way, my question to you. But could I just deal, one, one thing? Very quickly. His son didn't have a job for a long time, was sadly no longer in the military service. I won't get into that. And he didn't have a job. As soon as he became vice president, Burisma, not the best, look, not the best reputation in the world. I hear they paid him 183000 a month. Listen to this. 183, and they gave him a three million dollar upfront payment. All right, and he had no I, energy. I'm going to let the vice president That's respond to that quickly, and then dishonest. I need to get to a question to you. Very no quickly, basis for that. Everybody investigated that. No one said anything he did was wrong in Ukraine. Okay, President Trump, this is for you. Since you took office, you've never divested from your business. You've personally promoted your properties abroad. A report this week, which was referenced, does indicate that your company has a bank account in China. So how can voters know that you don't have any foreign conflicts of interest? I have many bank accounts, and they're all listed, and they're all over the place. I mean, I was a businessman doing business. The bank account you're referring to, which is everybody knows about it, it's listed. The bank account was in 2013. That's what it was. It was opened and it was closed in 2015, I believe. And then I decided because I was going to do, I was thinking about doing a deal in China like millions of other people. I was thinking about it and I decided I'm not going to do it. Didn't like it. I decided not to do it. Had an account open and I closed it. Okay. Excuse me. And then, unlike him, where he's vice president and he does business, I then decided to run for president after that. That was before. So I closed it before I even ran for president, let alone became president. Big difference. He is the vice president of the United States, and his son, his brother, and his other brother are getting rich. They're like a vacuum cleaner. They're sucking okay, up president money. Okay, President Trump, place thank you. Goes. We do it's need to true. move on. I do want to ask you, uh, Vice President Biden, about China. Let's talk about China more broadly. There have, of course, President Trump has said that they should pay for not being fully transparent in regards to the coronavirus. If you were president, would you make China pay? And please be specific. What would that look like? What I'd make China do is play by the international rules, not like he has done. He has caused the deficit of China to go up, not down, with China, up, not down. We are making sure that in order to do business in China, you have to give all your intellectual property. You have to get a, have a partner in China. It's 51%. We would not do that at all, number one. 
Number two, we're in a situation where China would have to play by the rules internationally as well. When I met with Xi that, and uh, when I was still vice president, he said we're setting up air identification zones in the, in the South China Sea. You can't fly through them. I said, we're going to fly through them. We just flew B-52, B-1 bombers through it. We're not going to pay attention. They have to play by the rules. And what's he do? He embraces guys like the thugs like in North Korea and and, uh, and the Chinese president and Putin and others. And he pokes his finger in the eye of all of our friends, all of our allies. We make up only, we were 25 percent, 25 percent of the world's economy. We need to be having the rest of our friends with us saying to China, these are the rules. You play by them or you're going to pay the price for not paying by them economically. That's the way I will run it. And that's what we did in upholding steel tariffs and a range of other things when we were president and vice president. All right. Let's talk oh, about oh, North oh, Korea. Oh, oh, excuse me. No, I have to yes. respond to that. Okay. Very quickly, and then we're going to move on to North Korea. with a billion and a half dollars from China to not manage true. after spending 10 minutes in office and being in Air Force Two, number one. Number two. There's a very strong email talking about your family wanting to make $10 million a year for introductions. President introductions. Trump, on China Not policy, true. though, what no, specifically no, are you going to do? What specifically are you going to do to make China pay? You've said you're going to make all, them pay. China is paying. They're paying billions and billions of dollars. I just gave $28 New billion. Dollars New sanctions? I just gave $28 billion to our farmers. Taxpayers' China, money. That's what? Taxpayers' money. No, no, yeah, China. you know the taxpayers. It's called China. China Not paid true. 28 billion, and you know what they did to pay it, Joe? They devalued their currency, and they also paid up. And you know who got the money? Our farmers, our great farmers, because they were targeted. You never charged them anything. Also, I charged them 25 percent on dumped steel because they were killing our steel industry. We were not going to have a steel industry. Okay. And now we have a steel okay. industry. Okay, Vice President Biden, your response, please. My response is: Look, this isn't about. There's a reason why he's bringing up all this malarkey. There's a reason for it. He doesn't want to talk about the, the, the substantive issues. It's not about his family and my family. It's about your family. And your family's hurting badly. If you're making less than, if you're a middle class family, you're getting hurt badly right now. You're sitting at the kitchen table this morning deciding, well, we can't get new tires, they're bald because we have to wait another month or so. Or are we going to be able to pay the mortgage? Or who's going to tell her she can't go back to, to community college? They're the decisions you're making in the middle class families like I grew up in Scranton and Claymont. They're in trouble. We should be talking about your families, but that's the last thing he wants to talk about. I want to, a I want to talk about statement. North Korea. Me, I do want to second, turn to please. 10 seconds, Mr. President. That's 10 a seconds. typical political statement. Let's get off this China thing. And then he looks, the family, around the table, everything. Just right. a typical politician when I see that. Let's talk I'm about North Korea. I'm not a typical Korea politician. Okay, That's President. why I got elected. That let's was, talk let's about get off the subject of China. Let's talk around sitting around the table. All right. Come on, Joe, you can do better. We're going to talk about North Korea now. President Trump, you've met with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un three times. You've talked about your beautiful letters with him. You've touted the fact that there hasn't been a war or a long-range missile test. And yet North Korea recently rolled out its biggest ever intercontinental ballistic missile and continues to develop its nuclear arsenal. Do you see that as a betrayal of the relationship you no. forged? Just 30 seconds here because we need to get on to the next So one. when I met with Barack Obama, we sat in the White House. Right at the beginning, had a great conversation. It was supposed to be 15 minutes, and it was well over an hour. He said, the biggest problem we have with North is North Korea. He indicated we will be in a war with North Korea. Guess what? It would be a nuclear war. And he does have plenty of nuclear capability. In the meantime, I have a very good relationship with him. Different kind of a guy, but he probably thinks the same thing about me. We have a different kind of a relationship. We have a very good relationship, and there's no war. And, you know, about two months ago, he broke into a certain area. They said, oh, there's going to be trouble. I said, no, they're not, because he's not going to do that. And I was right. Look, instead of being in a war where millions of people, Seoul, you know, is 25 miles away, millions and millions, 32 million people in Seoul, millions of people would be okay. dead right now. President we Trump, that's 30 war, seconds. Good Thank you. Vice President Biden, to you, North Korea conducted four nuclear tests under the Obama administration. Why do you think you would be able to rein in this persistent threat? Because right I'd make it clear, which we were making clear to China, they had to be part of the deal, because here's the re I made it clear and as a spokesperson of the administration when I went to China, that they said, why are you moving your missile defense up so close? Why are you moving more forces here? Why are you continuing to do 
uh, um, uh, military maneuvers with South Korea. I said, because North Korea is a problem, and we're going to continue to do it so we can control them. We're going to make sure we can control them and make sure they cannot hurt us. And so if you want to do something about it, step up and help. If not, it's going to continue. What has he done? He's legitimized North Korea. He's talked about his good buddy, who's a thug, a thug, and he talks about how we're better off. And they are, have much more capable missiles, able to reach U.S. territory much more easily than ever did before. Let me follow up with you, Vice President Biden. You've said you wouldn't meet with Kim Jong-un without preconditions. Are there any conditions under which you would meet with him? On the condition that he would agree that he would be drawing down his nuclear capacity to get that the Korean Peninsula should be nuclear-free zone. All right, let's move on to American families. President, they tried Very to quickly, meet with 10 him. Seconds, President. They tried to meet with him. He I wouldn't didn't. do it. He didn't like Obama. He didn't like him. He wouldn't do it. Okay, I got to give him a chance to respond to that before he we move do on. It. You and know that's I... okay. You know what? North Korea, we're not in a war. We have a good relationship. You know, people don't understand. Having a good relationship Trump, with leaders of other countries is a lot a good of thing. We have a lot of questions to get yes. to. Not Your response. We had a good relationship with Hitler before he, in fact, invaded Europe the rest of Europe. Come on. The reason he would not meet with President Obama is because President Obama said, we're going to talk about denuclearization. We're not going to legitimize you. We're going to continue to put stronger and stronger sanctions on you. That's why he wouldn't meet with us. All right. Let's and it didn't move happen. On. Let's Excuse move me. on and talk he about American families. He left me families. a mess, Chris. President Trump, okay, we they do need to move on. They left me a mess. North Korea was a mess. We and in fact, if you so remember the first two or three months, tonight, there was a very Trump. dangerous period of my first three months before we sort of worked things out a little bit. Okay. There was a very day. They left us a mess. And Obama would be, I think, the first to say it was the single biggest problem he thought that our country. OK, had. let's move on to American families and the economy. One of the issues that's most important to them is health care, as you both know. Today, there was a key vote on a new Supreme Court justice, Amy Coney Barrett, and health care is at the center of her confirmation fight. Over 20 million Americans get their health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. It's headed to the Supreme Court, and your administration, Mr. President, is advocating for the court to overturn it. If the Supreme Court does overturn that law, those 20 million Americans could lose their health insurance almost overnight. So what would you do if those people have their health insurance taken away? You have two minutes uninterrupted. Sure. First of all, I've already done something that nobody thought was possible. Through the legislature, I terminated the individual mandate. That is the worst part of Obamacare, as we call it. The individual mandate where you have to pay a fortune for the privilege of not having to pay for bad health insurance. I terminate it. It's gone. Now it's in court because Obamacare is no good. But then I made a decision. Run it as well as you can to my people, great people. Run it as well as you can. I could have gone the other route and made everybody very unhappy. They ran it. Uh, premiums are down. Everything's down. Here's the problem. No matter how well you run it, it's no good. What we'd like to do is terminate it. We have the individual mandate done. I don't know that it's going to work. If we don't win, we will have to run it and we'll have Obamacare, but it'll be better run. But it no longer is Obamacare because without the individual mandate, it's much different. Pre-existing conditions will always stay. What I would like to do is a much better health care, much better, will always protect people with pre-existing. So I'd like to terminate Obamacare, come up with a brand new, beautiful health care. The Democrats will do it because there'll be tremendous pressure on them, and we might even have the House by that time. And I think we're going to win the House, okay? You'll see, but I think we're going to win the House. But come up with a better health care, always protecting people with pre-existing conditions. And one thing very important, we have 180 million people out there that have great private health care far more than we're talking about with Obamacare. Joe Biden is going to terminate all of those policies. These are people that love their health care, people that have been successful, middle-income people, been successful. They have 180 million plans, 180 million people, families. Under what he wants to do, which will basically be socialized medicine, he won't even have a choice, they want to terminate 180 million plans. We have done an incredible job on health care, and we're going to do even better. OK, Let Vice President Biden, yes, this is for you. Your health care plan calls for building on Obamacare. So my question is, what is your plan if the law is ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court? You have two minutes uninterrupted. 
What I'm going to do is pass Obamacare with a public option. It will become Biden care. The public option is an option that says that if you, in fact, do not have the wherewithal to be — if you qualify for Medicaid and you do not have the wherewithal in your state to get Medicaid, you automatically are enrolled, providing competition for insurance companies. That's what's going to happen. Secondly, we're going to make sure we reduce the premiums and reduce drug prices by making sure that there's competition that doesn't exist now by allowing the Medicare to negotiate drug prices with the insurance companies. Thirdly, the idea that I want to eliminate private insurance, the reason why I had such a fight for — with 20 candidates for the nomination was I support private insurance. That's why I did — not one single person with private insurance would lose their insurance under my plan, nor did they under Obamacare. They did not lose their insurance unless they chose they wanted to go to something else. Lastly, we're going to make sure we're in a situation that we actually protect preexisting. There's no way he can protect preexisting conditions. None. Zero. You can't do it in the ether. He's been talking about this for a long time. There is no — he's never come up with a plan. I guess we're going to get the preexisting condition plan the same time we get the infrastructure plan that we've been waiting for since 17, 18, 19, and 20. The fact — I still have a, little, a few more minutes. I know you're getting anxious. The, <laughs> the fact is that the, he's already cost the American people because of his terrible handling of the COVID virus and the economic spillover. Ten million people have lost their private insurance. And he wants to take away 22 million more people who have it under Obamacare and over 110 million people with pre-existing conditions, and all the people from COVID are going to have pre-existing conditions, what are they going to do? I have a follow-up for you, Vice President sure. Biden. It relates to something that President Trump said. He's accusing you of wanting socialized medicine. What do you say to people who have concerns that your health care plan, which includes a government insurance option, takes the country one step closer to a health care system run entirely by the government? What's your I say it's to ridiculous. It's like saying that, you know, we're uh, — the idea that the fact that there's a public option that people can choose, that makes it a socialist plan. Look, the difference between the president, I think health care is not a privilege, it's a right. Everyone should have the right to have affordable health care. And I am very proud of my plan. It's gotten endorsed by all the major labor unions as well as, as well as a whole range of other people who in fact are concerned in the medical field. This is something that's going to save people's lives and this is going to give some people an opportunity an opportunity to have health care for their children. How many of you home are worried and rolling around in bed tonight wondering what in God's name you're going to do if you get sick because you've lost your home insurance, your, your, your health insurance, your company's gone under? We have to provide health insurance for people at an affordable rate, and that's what I do. President Trump, Excuse me, he was there response. for 47 years. He didn't do it. <laughs> he was now there as vice president for eight years. And it's not like it was 25 years ago. It was three and three quarters. It was just a little while ago, right? Less than four years ago. He didn't do anything. He didn't do it. He wants socialized medicine. And it's not that he wants it. His vice president, I mean, she is, is more liberal then Bernie Sanders and wants it even more. Bernie Sanders wants it. The Democrats want it. You're going to have socialized medicine, just like you went with fracking. We're not going to have fracking. We're going to stop fracking. We're going to stop fracking. Then he goes to Pennsylvania after he gets a nomination, where he got very lucky to get it. And he goes to Pennsylvania <laughs> and he says, oh, we're going to have fracking. And you never asked that question. And by the way, so far, I respect very much the way you're handling this, I have to say. By the way. But somebody should ask the question. You can ask he, the he goes for a year. There will be we no have a, fracking. We, have, there we will do be have no a number petroleum. of we have a number of topics. No, we're no, but that's to. a big, we, that's a big we, question. We're going to get to we're, we're going to get to I, I, the same topic. thing with socialized medicine. I have to respond. Vice President, your response, please. My response is: people deserve to have affordable health care. Period. 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 And the Biden care proposal will, in fact, provide for that affordable health care, lower premiums. What we're going to do is going to cost some money. It's going to cost over $750 billion over 10 years to do it. And they're going to have lower premiums. You can buy into the better plans, the cheaper plans, lower your premiums, deal with un 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 unexpected billing, and have your drug prices drop significantly. He keeps talking about it. He hasn't done a thing for anybody on health care. Not a thing. Tristan, when Very he quickly, says, then I want to talk about he what's says happening on Capitol option, Hill. He's talking about socialized medicine and, and, and health care. When he talks about a public option, he's talking about destroying your Medicare, totally Wrong. destroyed, and destroying your Social Security. And this whole country will come down. You know, Bernie Sanders tried it. 
in his state. He tried it in his state. His governor was a very liberal governor. They want to make it work. Okay, it, let's hear. It was let's let Vice President Biden respond. Work. It doesn't Vice work. President he's Biden a very responds. confused guy. He thinks he's running against somebody else. He's running against Joe Biden. I beat all those other people because I disagreed with them. Joe Biden he's running against. And the idea that we're in a situation that are going to destroy Medicare, this is the guy that the actuary at Medicare said, if in fact, at Social Security, if in fact he continues to withhold his plan to withhold the tax on Social Security, Social Security will be bankrupt in by 2023 with no way to make up for it. This is the guy who's tried to cut Medicare. So I don't I mean, the idea that Donald Trump is lecturing me on Social Security and Medicare. Come on. He tried to get Ten rid seconds, of he Mr. tried President, to hurt Social to Security to years question. ago, years ago. Go back and look at the records. He tried to hurt Social Security years ago. All right, thing, let's move on. I'm going to move on. Let me, they Mr. President, I have to move week, on to the next question. They said the stock market we're not will have time boom to talk about it. if I'm elected. If he's elected, the stock market will crash. Okay, let's move on to the next question that. very Mark, quickly. Look, the idea that the stock market is booming is his only measure of what's happening. Where I come from in Scranton and Claymont, the people don't live off of the stock market. Just in the, uh, just in the last three, uh, three years during this crisis, so the, the billionaires in this country made, according to the Wall Street, $700 billion more dollars. $700 billion more dollars because that's his only measure. What happens to the ordinary people out there? What happens to them? Let's talk about what's happening on Capitol Hill. We're, we're going to move on, 401ks gentlemen. are through the roof. We're going to move on. stock are through the roof. All right. And he doesn't come from Scranton. That's like one of the, He lived there for a short period gonna, of time before okay, he even knew we're it. We're going to move on to the next left. question. And the people of Pennsylvania Let me will move show on to my that. next question, they gentlemen. Understand. As of tonight, more than 12 million people are out of work. And as of tonight, 8 million more Americans have fallen into poverty. And more families are going hungry every day. Those hit hardest are women and people of color color. They see Washington fighting over a relief bill. Mr. President, why haven't you been able to get them the help they need? 30 seconds here. Because Nancy Pelosi doesn't want to approve it. I do. But you're the president. I do, but I still have to get. Unfortunately, that's one of the reasons I think we're going to take over the House because of her. Nancy Pelosi doesn't want to approve anything because she'd love to have some victories on a date called November 3rd. Nancy Pelosi does not want to approve it. We are ready, willing, and able to do something. Don't forget, we've already approved three plans, and it's gone through, including the Democrats, in all fairness. This one she doesn't want. It's near the election because she thinks it helps her politically. I think it hurts her politically. All right, Mr. Uh, Vice President, you know, The Republican leader in the, in, the, in the United States Senate said he can't pass it. He will not be able to pass it. He does not have Republican votes. Why isn't he talking to his Republican friends? Let me follow up with you, Vice President if we made a Biden, deal, because the let me, let me ask Vice President Biden a question. You are the leader of the Democratic Party. Why have you not pushed the Democrats to get a deal for the American people? Well, I have, and they have pushed it. Look, they passed this act all the way back in the beginning of the summer. This is like it's not new. It's been out there. This HEROES Act has been sitting there. And look at what's happening. When I was in charge of the Recovery Act with $800 billion, I was able to get $145 billion to local communities that have to balance their budgets and states that have to balance their budgets, so then have to fire fire they have to fire firefighters, teachers, first responders, law enforcement officers, so they could keep their cities and counties running. He will not support that. They have not done a thing for them. And Mitch McConnell said, let them go bankrupt. Let them go bankrupt. Come on. What's the matter the with this? The bill that guys? was passed in the House was a bailout of badly run, high crime, Democrat, all run by Democrats, cities and states. It was a way of getting a lot of money, billions and billions of dollars to these kids. It was also a way of getting a lot of money from our people's pockets to people that come into our country illegally. We were going to take care of everything for them. And what that does, and I'd love to do that, I'd love to help them, but what that does, everybody all over the world will start pouring into our country. We can't do it. This was a way of taking care of them. This was a way of spending on things that had nothing to do with COVID, as per your question. But it was really a big bailout for badly run Democrat cities and states. All right, way, I want to. If I get elected, I'm not going to, I'm running as a proud Democrat, but I'm going to be an American president. I don't see red states and blue states. 
What I see is American, United States. And folks, every single state out there finds themselves in trouble. They're going to start laying off, whether they're red or blue, cops, firefighters, first responders, because teachers, because they have to balance their budget. And the founders were smart. They allowed the federal government to deficit spend to compensate for the United States of America. I want to talk about the minimum wage, gentlemen. Mr. Yeah. Vice President, we are talking a lot about struggling small businesses yes. and business owners these days. Do you think this is the right time to ask them to raise the minimum wage? You, of course, support a $15 federal minimum I wage. I do, because I think one of the things we're going to have to do is we're going to have to bail them out, too. We should be bailing them out now, those small businesses. You got one in six of them going under. They're not going to be able to make it back. They passed a, pre a, a package that allows us to be able to call PPP. Money is supposed to go to help them do everything from organize how they can deal with their businesses being open safely. D d schools, how they can make classrooms smaller, how they can hire more teachers, how they can put ventilation systems in. They need the help. The businesses as well as the schools need the help. But this, these guys will not help them is not giving them any of the money. We are going to move See, on to immigration, one, one thing, very but quickly, I want to get He said we have reaction. to help our small businesses by raising the minimum wage. That's not helping. Uh, I think right. it should be a state option. Alabama is different than New York. New York is different from Vermont. Every state is different. It should be a state you, option. You said very we recently. We have to help. It's very important. We have to help our small businesses. You, you How said, are you helping your small businesses when you're forcing wages? What's going to happen and what's been proven to happen is when you do that, these small businesses fire many of their employees. You said Not very true, recently you would consider the raising the federal minimum Say wage it. to $15 Say an hour. It. You said recently you would consider raising the federal minimum wage to $15 I, an really hour. Like, is that still the case? And I would consider it. In a, to an extent, but in a what I really like, what I re in a second administration, but not to a level that's going to put all these businesses out of business. It should be a state option. Look, Every... I've lived in different places. I know different places. They're all different. Some places, fifteen dollars is not so bad. In other places, other states, fifteen dollars. Okay, would be President ruinous. Trump. Thank no, you. Quick no response, Vice President Biden. Two jobs, one job, be below poverty. People are making six, seven, eight bucks an hour. These first responders, we all clap for as they come down the street because they've allowed us to make it. What's happening? They deserve a minimum wage of $15. Anything below that puts you below the poverty level. And there is no evidence that when you raise the minimum wage, businesses go out of business. That is simply not true. We're going to talk no about soul. immigration. We're going to talk about immigration now, gentlemen. And we're going to talk about families within this context. Mr. President, your administration separated children from their parents at the border, at least 4,000 kids. You've since reversed your zero tolerance policy, but the United States can't locate the parents of more than 500 children. So how will these families ever be reunited? Uh, children are brought here by coyotes and lots of bad people, cartels, and they're brought here and they used to use them to get into our country. We now have as strong a border as we've ever had. We're over 400 miles of brand new wall. You see the numbers and we let people in, but they have to come in legally and they come in through. But Maryland. how will you reunite let me these just tell kids you, with their families, let me just tell you, Mr. President? They built cages. You know, they used to say, I built the cages. And then they had a picture in a certain newspaper and it was a picture of these horrible cages. And they said, look at these cages. President Trump built them. And then it was determined they were built in 2014. That was him. Do you they have a built plan cages. to reunite the kids? Yes, we're working families? on it very, we're, we're trying very hard. But a lot of these kids come out without the parents. They come over through cartels and through coyotes and through gangs. Vice President Biden, let me bring you into this conversation. Quick response and then another question to you. These 500 plus kids came with parents. They separated them at the border to make it a disincentive to come to begin with. They real tough. We're really strong. And guess what? They cannot. It's not coyotes didn't bring them over. Their parents were with them. They got separated from their parents. And it makes us a laughing stock and violates every notion of who we are as a nation. Let me ask you a follow-up question. They did it. We changed the policy. Your response they to that? They did it. We, we changed. did not. They separate built the cages. The they, who, who built the cages, let's, Joe? Let's talk about what who we're built talking the cages, about. Let's Joe? Let's talk about what we're talking about. What happened? Parents were ripped, their kids were ripped from their arms and separated. And now they cannot find over 500 of sets of those parents, and those kids are alone. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. 
It's criminal. It's criminal. Let me ask Kristen, you about I will say this. They went down. We brought reporters, everything. They are so well taken care of. They're in facilities that were so clean. But some of them haven't been reunited good. But just families. ask one question. Who built the cages? I'd love you to ask him that. Who built the cages? Let me ask about your immigration policy, Mr. Vice President. The Obama administration did fail to deliver immigration reform, which had been a key promise during the administration. It also presided over record deportations as well as family detentions at the border before changing course. So why should voters trust you with an immigration overhaul now? Because it made a mistake. It, made too, it took too long to get it right. It took too long to get it right. I'll be president of the United States, not vice president of the United States. And the fact is, I've made it very clear. Within 100 days, I'm going to send to the United States Congress a pathway to citizenship for over 11 million undocumented people. And all of those so-called dreamers, those DACA kids, they're going to be immediately certified again to be able to stay in this country and put on a path to citizenship. The idea that they are being sent home by this guy and they want to do that is they've gone to a country they've never seen before. I can imagine you're five years old, your parents are taking you across the, the Rio Grande River and it's, and, it's, and it's illegal. And you say, oh no, mom, leave me here. I'm not going to go with you. They've been here. Many of them are model citizens. Over 20,000 of them are first responders out there taking care of people during this crisis. We owe them. We owe them. President Kristen, Trump, he had reaction. eight years to do what he said he was going to do. And I've changed without having a specific. We got rid of catch and release. We got rid of a lot of horrible things that they put in and that they lived with. But he had eight years he was vice president. He did nothing except build cages to keep children in. Vice President Wrong. Biden, your response. The catch and release. You know what he's talking about there? If, in fact, you had a family came across and they were arrested. They, in fact, were given a date to show up for their hearing. They were released. And guess what? They showed up for a hearing. And this is the first president in the history of the United States of America that's anybody seeking asylum has to do it in another country. That's never happened before in America. That's never happened before in America. You come to the United States and you make your case that I seek asylum based on the following, on the following premise, why I deserve it under American law. They're sitting in squalor on the other side of the river. President Trump, your response, so 30 important. seconds, and then we'll move It on. just shows that he has no understanding of immigration or the laws. Catch and release is a disaster. A murderer would come in. A rapist would come in. A very bad person would come in. We would take their name. We have to release them into our country. And then you say they come back. Less than 1% of the people come back. We have to send ICE out and Border Patrol out to find them. We would say, come back in two years, three years. We're going to give you a court case. You need Perry Mason. We're going to give you a court case. When you say they come back, they don't come back, Joe. They, they never come back. Only the really, I hate to say this, but those with the lowest IQ, they might come back. Okay, but President very, Trump, very let's very give few. Vice President Biden a chance to respond, and then we're going to move on to the you next section. You don't know section. the law, Joe. Vice President Biden, law. your response. Know the law. What he's telling you is simply not true. Well, check, check it, it out. out. They don't come back. Check it out. All right, let's move but on But we don't have to, to worry about section. it because they terminated it, so we don't have to worry about let's it Let's move right. on to the next section. you have section. 525 kids not knowing where in God's name they're going to be and lost their parents. Go ahead. All right. Let's talk about our next section, which is race in America. And I want to talk about the way black and brown Americans experience race in this country. Part of that experience is something called the talk. It happens regardless of class and income. Parents who feel they have no choice but to prepare their children for the chance that they could be targeted, including by the police, for no reason other than the color of their skin. Mr. Vice President, in the next two minutes, I want you to speak directly to these families. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? I do. I do. You know, my daughter is a social worker, and uh, she's, all, she's written a lot about this. She has a graduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania in social work. And, you know, uh, one of the reasons why I ended up working on the east side of Wilmington, Delaware, which is 90 percent African-American, was to learn more about what was going on. What I didn't, I never had to tell my daughter, if she's pulled over, 
make sure she puts for a traffic stop, put both hands on top of the wheel and don't reach for the glove box because someone may shoot you. But a black parent, no matter how wealthy or how poor they are, has to teach their child when you're walking down the street, don't have a hoodie on when you go across the street, making sure that you, in fact, if you get pulled over, yes, yes, sir, no, sir, hands on top of the wheel, because you are, in fact, the victim, whether you're a person making 300,000, child of a $300,000 a year person or someone who's on, on, on food stamps. The fact of the matter is, there is institutional racism in America. And we have always said, we've never lived up to it, that we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal. But guess what? We have never, ever lived up to it, but we've always constantly been moving the needle further and further to inclusion, not exclusion. This is the first president to come along and says, that's the end of that. We're not going to do that anymore. We have to provide for economic opportunity, better education, better health care, better access to schooling, better access to opportunity to borrow money to start businesses. All the things we can do, and I've laid out a clear plan as to how to do those things, just to give people a shot. It's about accumulating the ability to have wealth as well as it is to be free from violence. President Trump, same question to you, and let me remind you of the question. I would like you to speak directly to these families. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? Yes, I do. And again, he's been in government 47 years. He never did a thing, except in 1994, when he did such harm to the black community. And they were called, and he called them, super predators. And he said that. He said it, super predators. And they have never lived that down. 1994, your crime bill, the super predators. Nobody has done more for the black community than Donald Trump. And if you look, with the exception of Abraham Lincoln, possible exception, but the exception of Abraham Lincoln, nobody has done what I've done. Criminal justice reform, Obama and Joe didn't do it. I don't even think they tried because they had no chance at doing it. They might have wanted to do it, but if you had to see the arms I had to twist to get that done, it was not a pretty picture, and everybody knows it, including some very liberal people that cried in my office. They cried in the Oval Office. Two weeks later, they're out saying, gee, we have to defeat him. Criminal justice reform, prison reform, opportunity zones with Tim Scott, a great senator from South Carolina. He came in with this incredible idea for Opportunity Zones. It's one of the most successful programs. People don't talk about it. Tremendous investment is being made. Biggest beneficiary, the black and Hispanic communities, and then historically black colleges and universities. After three years of coming to the office, I love some of those guys. They were great. They came into the office and they said, I said, what are you doing? After three years, I said, why do you keep coming back? Because we have no funding. I said, you don't have to come back every year. We have to come back because President Obama would never give them long-term funding, and I did. Ten-year long-term funding, and I gave them more money than they asked for because they said, I think you need more. And I said, the only bad part about this is I may never see you again because I got very friendly with them, and they like me and I like them. But I saved it. Colleges and universities. Okay, and we're going to talk about both of your records, but your response to that, Vice President. My response to that is I never, ever said what he accused me of saying. The fact of the matter is, in 2000, though, after the crime bill had been in, 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 in the law for a while, this is a guy who said the problem with the crime bill, there's not enough people in jail. There's not enough people in jail. And go on my website, get the quote, the date, when he said it. Not enough people. He talked about marauding gangs, young gangs, and the people who are going to maraud our cities. This is a guy who, in the Central Park Five, five innocent black kids, he continued to push for making sure that they got the death penalty. None of them were, none of them were guilty of what the crime, of the crimes they were suggested. Look, and talk about, he, granted, he did, in fact, let, 20 people, he commuted 20 people sentences. We commuted over a thousand people sentences, over a thousand. The very law he's talking about is a law that in fact initiated by Barack Obama. And secondly, we're in a situation here where we, 
the federal prison system was reduced by 38,000 people under our administration. And one of these things we should be doing, there should be no, no minimum ma mandatories in the law. That's why I'm offering $20 billion to states to change their state laws to eliminate minimum mandatories and set up drug courts. No one should be going to jail because they have a drug problem. They should be going to rehabilitation, not to jail. We should fundamentally change the system, and that's what I'm going to do. But why didn't he do it four years ago? Why didn't you do that four years ago, even less than that? Why didn't you I do am it? You not were vice president. You keep talking about all these things you're going to do, and you're going to do this. But you were there just a short time ago, and you guys did nothing. We did. You know, Joe, I, I ran because of you. I ran because of Barack Obama, because you did a poor job. If I thought you did a good job, I would have never run. Uh, I would have never run. <laughs> I ran because of you. I'm looking at you now. You're a politician. I ran because of you. All right, Vice President Biden, your response to that, and then I do have some yeah. questions for both of you. Well, I tell you what, I, uh, I hope he does look at me because what's happening here is you know who I am. You know who he is. You know his character. You know my character. You know our reputations for honor and telling the truth. I am anxious to have this race. I am anxious to see this take place. I am the character of the country is on the ballot. Our character is on the ballot. Look at us closely. Let me ask some follow-up. Please respond, if and then we're going to have follow-up. If this is true question. about Russia, Ukraine, China, other countries, Iraq, if this is true, then he's a corrupt politician. Right. So don't give me the stuff about how you're this innocent baby. Joe, they're calling you a corrupt politician. Nobody hey, President the Trump, I want to stay hell. on the issue Excuse of race. Me. We're Take talking about the, the issue. Take laptop from hell. President Trump, Nobody. we're talking about race right now, and I do want to stay on the issue of race. President Trump, you've I have to respond to that. Please. Because, look, Very there are 50 former national intelligence folks who said that what this he's accusing me of is a Russian plant. They have said that this is, has all the care. Four, five former heads of the CIA, both parties, say what he's saying is a bunch of garbage. Nobody believes it except the, his and his good friend, Rudy Gianni. You mean the laptop is now no. another Russia, Russia, Russia hoax? And you that's exactly be. what, is this that's where exactly going? what This is told. where he's going. The laptop that, right. is Russia, yes. Russia, Gentlemen, Russia? I want to stay on the issue of race. You okay? have to be kidding. Here Mr. we go President, again with Russia. We're going to continue boy, on the boy. issue of race. Mr. President, you've described one. the Black Lives Matter movement as a symbol of hate. You've shared a video of a man chanting white power to millions of your supporters. You've said that black professional athletes exercising their First Amendment rights should be fired. What do you say to Americans who say that kind of language from a president is contributing to a climate of hate and racial strife? Well, you have to understand, the first time I ever heard of Black Lives Matter, they were chanting, pigs in a blanket, talking about police. Pigs, pigs, talking about our police. Pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. I said, that's a horrible thing. And they were marching down the street. And that was my first uh, glimpse of Black Lives Matter. I thought it was a terrible thing. As far as uh, my relationships with all people, I think I have great relationships with all people. I am the least racist person in this room. Well, what do you say to Americans who are concerned by that rhetoric? I don't know. The, I mean, I don't videos. know what to say. I got criminal justice reform done and prison reform and opportunity zones. I took care of black colleges and universities. I don't know what to say. They can say anything. I mean, they can say anything. It's a very, it makes me sad because I am, I, I am the least racist person. I can't even see the audience because it's so dark. But I don't care who's in the audience. I'm the least racist person in this room. Okay. Vice President Biden, Abraham, let me ask you very quickly, and then I have a follow-up question for you. Abraham Lincoln here is one of the most racist presidents we've had in modern history. He pours fuel on every single racist fire. Every single one. He started off his campaign coming down the escalator saying he's going to get rid of those Mexican rapists. He's banned Muslims because they're Muslims. He has moved around and made everything worse across the board. He says to the, about the poor boys, last time we were on stage here, he said, I told him to stand down and stand ready. Come on. This guy has a dog whistle about as big as a foghorn. 
President Trump, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to respond, and then I have a follow-up. No, he made a reference to Abraham Lincoln. Where did that come in? I mean, you said you're that, Abraham Lincoln. No, no, where did that? No, no. You said, I said not since Abraham Lincoln has anybody right. done what I've done for the black community. And I'm saying, I didn't say I'm Abraham Lincoln. I said not since Abraham Lincoln has anybody please. done what I've done for the black community. Now, you have done nothing other than the crime bill, which put Oh, God. Th tens of thousands of black men, mostly, in jail. All right, let me, and you know let, what? Me, let me they ask Vice President Biden They remember it, because if you look at what's happening with the voting right now, let me ask they remember Vice President that Biden you treated them about very, very badly. The, the, Just take a look at what's happening out there. Vice President Biden, let me give you a chance to respond within this context. Crime okay. bills that you supported in the 80s and 90s contributed to the incarceration of tens of thousands of young black men who had small amounts of drugs in their possession. They are sons, they are brothers, their fathers, their uncles, whose families are still to this day, some of them suffering the consequences. So speak to those families. Why should they vote for you? One of the things is that in the 80s, we passed 100 percent, all 100 senators voted for it, a bill on drugs and how to deal with drugs. It was a mistake. I've been trying to change the sense and particularly the portion on cocaine. That's why I've been arguing that, in fact, we should not send anyone to jail for a pure drug offense. They should be going into treatment across the board. That's what we should be spending money on. That's why I set up drug courts, which were never funded by our Republican friends. They should not be going to jail for a drug or an alcohol problem. They should be going into treatment, treatment. That's what we've been trying to do. That's what I'm going to get done, because I think maybe the American people have now seen that, in fact, it was a mistake to pass those laws relating to drugs. But they were not in the crime bill. But okay. why so, didn't he get it done? See, it's all talk, no action with these politicians. Why didn't he get it done? That's uh, what I'm going to do when I become president. You were vice president, along with Obama as your president, your leader, for eight years. Why didn't you get it done? You had eight years to get it done. Now you're saying you're going to get it done because you're all talk and no action, Jim. We got a your lot response. of it done. We released 38,000 got 38, prisoners left from the You got out, nothing done. 38,000 prisoners were released from federal prison. We have, there were over 1,000 people who were given clemency. We have made, in fact, we're the ones that put in the legislation saying we could look at pattern and practice of police departments and what they were doing, how they were conducting themselves. I could go on, but we began the process. We began the process. We lost an election. That's why I'm running to win back that election and change his terrible policy. I just asked, and then we're I just move asked on one question. Why didn't you do it in the eight years, a short time ago? Why didn't you do it? You just said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. You put tens because of thousands of mostly black young men in prison. Now you're saying you're going to get you're going to undo that. Why didn't you get it done? You had eight years with Obama. You know because, why, Joe? Because you're all talk and no action. All right, Vice President because Biden, and then we're going to move on to the next section. We had a Republican Congress. Okay. That's the answer. Well, you okay. You've got to talk them into it, Joe. Sometimes all right. Sometimes you've got to talk them into it. We're going to move on to our next yeah. section, Like I did with criminal justice change. reform. Oh, okay. I had to talk Democrats into it. Gentlemen, you we're, did we're, we're running out of done. time, so we've got to get on to okay. climate change, please. You both have very different visions on climate change. President Trump, you say that environmental regulations have hurt jobs in the energy sector. Vice President Biden, you have said you see addressing climate change as an opportunity to create new jobs. For each of you, how would you both combat climate change and support job growth at the same time? Starting with you, President Trump, you have two minutes uninterrupted. So uh, we have the Trillion Trees program. We have so many different programs. I do love the environment, but what I want is the cleanest crystal clear water, the cleanest air. We have the best lowest number in carbon emissions, which is a big standard that I notice Obama goes with all the time. Not Joe. I haven't heard Joe use the term because I'm not sure he knows what it represents or means, but I have heard Obama use it. And we have the best carbon emission numbers that we've had in 35 years under this administration. We are working so well with industry, but here's what we can't do. Look at China, how filthy it is. Look at Russia. Look at India. It's 
filthy. The, the air is filthy. The Paris Accord, I took us out because we were going to have to spend trillions of dollars, and we were treated very unfairly. When they put us in there, they did us a great disservice. They were going to take away our businesses. I will not sacrifice tens of millions of jobs, thousands and thousands of companies because of the Paris Accord. It was so unfair. China doesn't kick in until 2030. Russia goes back to a low standard, and we kicked in right away. It would have been, it would have been, it would have destroyed our businesses. So, you ready? We have done an incredible job environmentally. We have the cleanest air, the cleanest water, and the best carbon emission standards that we've seen in many, many years. Vice President and we Biden. We haven't destroyed our industries. Vice President Biden, two minutes to you uninterrupted. Climate change and climate warming, the global warming, is an existential threat to humanity. We have a moral obligation to deal with it. And we're told by all the leading scientists in the world, we don't have much time. We're going to pass the point of no return within the next eight to ten years. Former years of this man eliminating all the regulations that were put in by us to clean up the climate, to clean up, to limit the, the uh, limit of emissions will put us in a position where we're going to be in real trouble. Here's where we have a great opportunity. I was able to get both all the environmental organizations as well as labor, the people worried about jobs, to support my climate plan. Because what it does, it will create millions of new good-paying jobs. We're going to invest in, for example, 500,000 50, 000, excuse me, 50,000 charging stations on our highways so that we can own the electric car market of the future. In the meantime, China is doing that. We're going to be in a position where we're going to see to it that we're going to take 4 million existing billion buildings and 2 million existing homes and retrofit them so they don't leak as much energy, saving hundreds of millions of barrels of oil in the process and creating significant number of jobs. And by the way, the whole idea of what this is all going to do, it's going to create millions of jobs and it's going to clean the environment. Our health and our jobs are at stake. That's what's happening. And what right now, by the way, Wall Street firms indicated that my plan, my, my plan will in fact create 18.6 million jobs, 7 million more than his. This is from Wall Street. And I'll create $1 trillion more in economic growth than his proposal does. Not on climate, just on the economy. President Trump, you're right. They came out and said very strongly, $6,500 will be taken away from families under his plan, that his plan is an economic disaster. If you look at what he wants to do, you know, the, if you look at his plan, Not, his environmental plan, you know who developed it? AOC plus three. They know nothing about the climate. I mean, she's got a good line of stuff, but she knows nothing about the climate. And they're all hopping through hoops for AOC plus three. Look, their real plan costs $100 trillion. If we had the best year in the history of our country for 100 years, we would not even come close to a number like that. When he says buildings, they want to take buildings down because they want to make bigger windows into smaller windows. As far as they're concerned, if you had no window, it would be a lovely thing. This is the craziest plan that anybody has ever seen. And this wasn't done by smart people. This wasn't done by anybody. Frankly, I don't even know how it can be good politically. Right. They want to spend $100 trillion. That's their real number. He's trying to say it was six. It's $100 <laughs> trillion. They want to knock down buildings and build new buildings with little, tiny, small windows. I mean, and many other things, okay. and many other things. Let me have the vice president respond, and we're crazy. running out of time, and we have a lot and more you'll questions to get our to. Country. So let's hear from the vice president. I have a number more questions. I don't know where he comes from. I don't know where he comes up with these numbers. Queen. $100 trillion. Give me a break. This plan was, um, this is plan is endorsed by every major, every major environmental group and every labor group, labor because they know the future lies. The future lies in us being able to breathe, and they know their good jobs in getting us there. And by the way, the fastest growing industry in America are, is, is, is the electric, the, uh, excuse me, uh, solar energy 
and wind. He thinks wind causes cancer, windmills. It's the fastest growing jobs, and they pay good prevailing wages, 45, 50 bucks an hour. We can grow and we can be cleaner if we go the route I'm proposing. President Trump, Excuse me. please we respond, energy, and then I have to follow We are follow energy up. independent for the first time. We don't need all of these countries that we had to fight war over because we needed their energy. We are energy independent. I know more about wind than you do. Oh. It's extremely expensive, kills all the birds. <laughs> it's very intermittent. It's got a lot of problems. And they happen to make the windmills in both Germany and China. And the fumes coming up, if you're a believer in carbon emission, the fumes coming up to make, make these massive windmills is more than anything that we're talking about with natural gas, which is very clean. One other thing. Find me a scientist solar. To say that. I love solar, but solar doesn't quite have it yet. It's not powerful yet to, to really run our big, beautiful factories that we need to compete with the world. So False. it's all a pipe dream. But you know what we'll do? We're going to have the greatest economy in the world. But if you want to kill the All economy, right. get rid of your oil industry. You want and, — and what about fracking? All right. Now, let me, now let we me have, have to ask Let me allow fracking. Vice President I Biden to respond. I never said I oppose fracking. Y you said it I, on tape. I did. Show the tape. Put it on your website. I'll put it on. Put it on the website. The fact of the matter is Shorty he's list. flat lying. Would you flat. rule out banning fracking? I do rule out banning fracking because the answer we need we need other industries to transition to get to ultimately a complete zero emissions by 2025. What I will do with fracking over time is make sure that we can capture the emissions from the fracking, capture the emissions from gas. We can do that, and we can do that by investing money in doing it. But it's a transition to that. I have one more question Excuse in this pod, and then we, me. we have. He was against fracking. He said it. I will show that to you tomorrow. I Good. am against fracking. Until he got the nomination, went to Pennsylvania, then he said, but you know what, Pennsylvania? He'll be against it very soon because his party is totally against fracking it. Fracking on federal land, I said. No fracking you and said or fracking. oil on federal land. Let me ask this final question in this section, and then I want to move on to our final section. President Trump, people of color are much more likely to live near oil refineries and chemical plants. In Texas, there are families who worry the plants near them are making them sick. Your administration has rolled back regulations on these kinds of facilities. Why should these families give you another four years in office? Uh, the families that we're talking about are employed heavily, and they are making a lot of money, more money than they've ever made. If you look at the kind of numbers that we produce for Hispanic, for Black, for Asian, it's nine times greater the percentage gain than it was under in three years than it was under eight years of the two of them, to put it nicely. Nine times more. Now, somebody lives, I have not heard the numbers or the statistics that you're saying, but they're making a tremendous amount of money economically. We saved it. And I saved it again a number of months ago when oil was crashing because of the pandemic. Okay. We saved it. We got, say what you want about relationship, we got Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Russia to cut back way back. We saved our oil industry, and now it's very vibrant again. Right. And everybody has very inexpensive gasoline. Remember Vice that. President Biden, your response, and then we're going to have a final question for both of you. My response is that those people live on what they call fence lines. He doesn't understand this. They live near chemical plants that, in fact, pollute chemical plants and oil plants and refineries that pollute. I used to live near that when I was growing up in Claymont, Delaware. And all the more oil refineries in Marcus Hook and the Delaware River than there is any place, including in Houston at the time. When my mom get in the car and when, when there were first frost to drive me to school, turn in the windshield wiper, there'd be an oil slick in the window. That's why so many people in my state were dying and getting cancer. The fact is those frontline communities, it doesn't matter what you're paying them. It matters how you keep them safe. What do you do? And you impose restrictions on the pollutions that it, the pollutants coming out of those fence line communities. Okay, I have one final would question. Would he close it down falls, the oil industry? It falls. W would you close down the falls. oil industry? By the way, industry? I would transition from the oil industry, yes. Oh, I would that's transition. a big statement. Thank it you. is a big statement. That's a because big statement. I would stop. Why would you do that? Because the oil industry pollutes significantly. Oh, I see. Here's the deal. But that's you can't a big do statement. That. Well, if you let me finish the statement, because it has to be replaced by renewable energy over time, over time. And I'd stop giving to the oil industry, I'd stop giving them federal subsidies.
He won't give federal subsidies to the to the gas. Excuse me, to the to uh, solar and wind. Yeah. Why are we giving it to oil industry? We actually do All give right. it to solar and wind. We and that's maybe the biggest question. statement in terms of business. That's the biggest statement. Okay. Because we basically what he's saying question, is he is Mr. going President. to destroy the oil industry. Okay. Will you remember that, Texas? Will you okay. remember that, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma? Vice President Biden, let me give you 10 seconds to respond, Ohio. and then I have to get to the final question. Vice President Biden. He takes everything out of context. But the point is, look, we have to move toward a net zero emissions. The first place to do that by the year 2035 is in energy okay. production by 2050 totally. All right. One is he final going to get China to, to do it? No, we're finished with is this. Is he we going to, to get China to do it? We have to move on to our question. No, we have to move on to our I'm going to rejoin Paris Accord and make oh. China abide by but, what they agreed to. All right. This is about dollars. leadership, gentlemen. And this first question does go to you, President Trump. Imagine this is your inauguration day. What will you say in your address to, America, to Americans who did not vote for you? You'll each have one minute, starting with you, Mr. We President. have to make a country totally successful, as it was prior to the plague coming in from China. Now we're rebuilding it, and we're doing record numbers, 11.4 million jobs in a short period of time, et cetera. But I will tell you, go back. Before the plague came in, just before, I was getting calls from people that were not normally people that would call me. They wanted to get together. We had the best black unemployment numbers in the history of our country. Hispanic, women, Asian, people with diplomas, with no diplomas, MIT graduates, number one in the class. Everybody had the best numbers. And you know what? The other side wanted to get together. They wanted to unify. Success is going to bring us together. We are on the road to success, but I'm cutting taxes, and he wants to raise everybody's taxes, and he wants to put new regulations on everything. He will kill it. If he gets in, you will have a depression, the likes of which you've never seen. Your 401ks will go to hell, and it'll be a very, very sad day for this country. All right. Vice President Biden, same question to you. What will you say during your inaugural address to Americans who did not vote for you? I will say I'm an American president. I represent all of you, whether you voted for me or against me. And I'm going to make sure that you're represented. I'm going to give you hope. We're going to move. We're going to choose science over fiction. We're going to choose hope over fear. We're going to choose to move forward because we have enormous opportunities, enormous opportunities to make things better. We can grow this economy. We can deal with the systemic racism. And at the same time, we can make sure that our economy is being run and moved and motivated by clean energy, creating millions of new jobs. And that's the fact. That's what we're going to do. And I'm going to say, as I said at the beginning, what is on the ballot here is the character of this country. Decency, honor, respect, treating people with dignity, making sure that everyone has an even chance. And I'm going to make sure you get that. You haven't been getting it the last four years. All right. I want to thank you both for a very robust hour and a half, a fantastic debate. Really appreciate it. President Trump, former Vice President Joe Biden, thank you to Belmont University for hosting us tonight. And most importantly, thank you to those watching tonight. Election Day is November 3rd. Don't forget to vote. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you. Well, we are back uh, with Mike Isikoff, chief investigative reporter for Yahoo News. Uh, and uh, we are watching uh, the candidates uh, and their wives, uh, masked wives, uh, on the debate stage after a spirited uh, uh, 90 minutes or more. Um, this was not uh, the... Um, uh, certainly a more subdued debate uh, than the last one, but hardly a love, love fest, a lot of zingers, uh, not friendly at all. Um, we um, are, I think, joined as well by Tim Miller. Um, Tim, are you there? I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, who served as uh, Jeb Bush's communications director during the 2016 presidential campaign. 
and now is a uh, contributor at The Bulwark. Uh, Tim, let's go to you first. Just give sure. us your, your overall impression of this debate um, and uh, what the sort of uh, kind of defining moment of it was, uh, if, there, if there was one, um, uh, and uh, the extent to which you think um, it will have an impact. Yeah, look, I mean, they, these do have impacts. Uh, these do have, have an impact. And at, at, um, at Bulwark and, and in my, other, my other hat at Republican Voters Against Trump, you know, we do focus groups and hear from voters who are still legitimately undecided. So, so this will have an impact. Uh, my take on, on tonight is that, you know, Donald Trump um, didn't have a tantrum like a five-year-old boy. Uh, so uh, he'll probably be graded on a curve because of that, uh, among the other pundits. But about among the, uh, when it comes to the big issue that is facing everybody in this country right now, all of us who are you know, either social distancing or stuck in our homes or, you know, for some people struggling to make ends meet, uh, they spent the first 20 minutes on it. He doesn't have a plan for that. He doesn't have a plan for dealing with the pandemic. Um, he wants everything just to go back to normal like magic, like he's wanted to from the start. And so... I think the fact that he doesn't have a good answer to that central question uh, is going to be uh, the big is the big problem for him. But I think he probably stopped the bleeding from the last debate, um, you know, uh, because because he didn't act like a child. Uh, and we are now joined as well by Susan Glasser. Uh, Susan is a staff writer for The New Yorker and co-author uh, of The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James Baker, that everyone uh, Everyone is talking about that book, uh, so congratulations. Um, what stood out for you uh, tonight? Well, right, aside from the lack of shouting and interruptions, uh, you know, it was it, it's painful to watch President Trump have to answer policy questions. You know, he just, it, it's just so remarkable that he's the president, but he really just doesn't want to talk about, uh, you know, the actual nitty gritty work of governing, and that includes governing during the pandemic, I agree with Tim that the first section on the on the coronavirus really is, you know, that is the defining issue of the election. And of course, that's what Trump has been trying to avoid for the last seven months because it's a terrible defining issue for an incumbent president to have lost more than 220,000 Americans on his watch. Uh, you know, it, it was a sort of facsimile of what a normal presidential debate would look like, uh, except if the incumbent president didn't really have a plan and you know, really was uncomfortable talking about basic issues. Uh, you know, the much vaunted Hunter Biden uh, allegations devolved into sort of a, you know, your corruption is worse than mine, finger pointing exercise, uh, Trump taxes versus, you know, what did Biden's son do? I think it was sort of a wash in the end. Hard to imagine that's what an undecided voter is going to pass their ballot on. Yeah, yeah, Isakov, I want to bring you in um, on the Hunter Biden allegations and the back and forth on corruption because uh, I, I sort of uh, put myself in the shoes of an average American voter listening to that who maybe hasn't read all the stories. Um, it didn't seem to me like Trump landed any real blows because it was just hard to understand. I mean, hard to know what he was talking about. I think we're we may be having an audio problem You're on here. Mute, I, I'm Michael. not. Mike, I think you might be on mute. Okay, yeah. All right. Well, hopefully we'll be able to solve uh, Isakoff's audio problem. Uh, but uh, I, you know, I throw it back to you, uh, Tim. Um, I, you, you know, I think this was what uh, the tr Trump campaign uh, was hoping that they would get traction on this issue. Uh, they would begin to you know, try to make the argument that they could disqualify Joe Biden uh, because because he's because he's corrupt. Uh, but it, it seems to me that on sort of these two in these two ways, both kind of hard to understand. There sort of aren't a lot of enough facts out there yet. No one really knows, yeah. understands the, the, the narrative. That's one. And secondly, uh, Joe Biden, uh, he, there's no sort of predisposition here to think that he is corrupt, right? I mean, isn't that part of the problem with, with trying to make that argument against him? Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought it was unfortunate that they went to it so early. That was my only, I thought Kristen did great tonight. But that'd be my only complaint about her. Uh, I mean, it's just a, it's a completely nonsense attack. I mean, I, I think that 
uh, Trump was completely unsuccessful, I think, at landing that and, and making people understand exactly what happened. He might have been successful at muddying the waters on the issue of corruption. And, and I think that that is, you know, if I'm the Biden campaign, I'm looking at tonight, I think he did a really good job talking about the kitchen table issues. And I think that was one of his main goals tonight. I don't know if he did as good of a job in distinguishing himself as uncorrupt, uh, somebody who has basic respect for American norms and institutions yeah, as compared um, to Trump. They kind of fought that to a draw a little bit where it was like, you did this, you did that. And I think so. I think Trump had some success in, 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 do, in, uh, in turning that into kind of a game of he said, he said. When it's like, yeah, I, I mean, Trump is literally taking money from the Turks right now. I'm like yelling at my TV screen. Like you're, Trump is taking money from Turkey right now <laughs> as we speak. And it's like, and, and, and meanwhile, he's like got all these, you know, confusing accusations about Biden. But I think an average viewer um, probably saw that as a draw. Okay, let's bring Isagoff back uh, in. Uh, we we yeah, be, Because points, you were making, um, yeah. go ahead. Uh, yeah, look, this was, um, you know, clearly uh, the Trump camp wanted to make an issue about the Hunter Biden stuff. And um, I agree. Uh, the, the, it it, it kind of fell flat. It got very much in the weeds. Uh, and for, you know, the overwhelming majority of Americans, you know, probably 99 percent who are not in the weeds on this story, uh, it, it would have had a very hard time figuring out what Trump, the points that Trump was trying to make, he didn't make them especially effectively. Um, you know, his char you know, he was kind of all over the map. He said, your family got three and a half million dollars from Russia. I never got any money from Russia. Of course, he was trying to do business in Russia while, while running for president. But overall, I think the debate was a wash. I mean, the only winner was Kristen Welker, who I thought did a masterful job of reining the candidates in and keeping it moving. Um, uh, I thought Biden had a few good lines. Uh, I don't look at the way at this the way he does blue states versus red states. We're all Americans, you know, uh, resonating, echoing Barack Obama in that famous 2004 convention speech. Uh, and I thought that was uh, that was pretty effective. I thought Trump had, you know, made a, a fairly decent line later when he said you had eight years. What did you do? You were a politician. You're all talking, no action. But overall, clearly no knockout blows. And I want to make one other point here. This was supposed to be a debate about national security. Remember? That was the original idea. And it barely came up in this debate. Uh, it, uh, you know, some talk about China a bit, but overall on foreign policy, uh, very little was said. Susan, uh, this is uh, really the, the last big um, de uh, event of the campaign. It's the last time that these two candidates will be on a stage together. Um, one of the things um, in the final debate that uh, president, presidential candidates are expected to try to do is to, uh, is to give a closing argument. Uh, did you hear closing arguments from either Trump or Biden tonight? You know, look, uh, that's been the mystery of Trump's campaign from, you know, for the last few months, really, is is it's unclear what he's running on. Uh, you know, the Republican Party didn't even pass a, a platform at its convention this year, I think, for the first time ever. Uh, so it's not entirely clear what Trump is running on. He was asked that directly, actually, by uh, the moderator, and I agree she did an excellent job tonight. And uh, he, he essentially said, I'm running to bring make America like 2019 again. Uh, which is a little bit hard to tell as a program for four years once you've been in office for four years. Uh, Biden, uh, you know, his closing argument was sort of unchanged by the, the back and forth over Hunter Biden and corruption. He basically is running on decency and values and the idea that this isn't, uh, you know, the America we want it to be. But he seemed a little bit rote when he offered that at the ending. I felt like he was a bit shaken uh, by the back and forth uh, with Trump. And he didn't even bring his normal passion to the question of why he's running for office. Uh, now he does have a huge amount more money than Donald Trump what does for the closing days. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you see the Biden campaign buying a chunk of airtime for him to offer the kind of more composed closing argument to the country that I didn't hear from him tonight. Yeah. Tim, what about you? Uh, I mean, I was sort of struck by the last question uh, that Christian Welker asked, imagine you are giving your inauguration address. Yeah. 
uh, and, ad and addressing the people who didn't vote for you. Uh, how do you think the candidates answered uh, that question? Yeah, look, I, I think that Biden had a two-pronged message, a closing message. Uh, you know, the first one was really just this kitchen table economics. Um, you know, I, I think he did really well in the minimum wage section, in the uh, COVID stimulus section, talking about people's families, talking about people struggling to make ends meet, how McConnell's not doing anything, how Trump is. I thought he, I thought he got that across quite well. You know, his other message, I kind of agree with Susan. I, I just, it's, it's frustrating because the contrast between Biden and Trump is so strong on the issue of decency and compassion. And, and you just, like, we're all kind of yearning for that big moment of contrast on this point when you just sort of rip through all of the ways, all of the you know, grotesqueries and indignities of the Trump era. And, and, and I thought his kind of close on that was wrote, Trump's closing message, I think what he's trying to do, besides the fact that he's very well versed in Burisma and knows a lot more details about Burisma than COVID, uh, I think his other closing message was that uh, he's not a politician. He was tried to go back to the 2016 closing message. Biden is a politician. He's been there 47 years. He couldn't get anything done. I was getting stuff done before the plague came in. I, I think I, I, in the last maybe 20 minutes, I think he did an okay job of getting that message across. Um, it's just, it came after a very, um, struggle bus section on, on COVID and then the confusing half hour on, you know, Biden and the bank accounts. It, it's cough. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to say, uh, I think that, uh, Tr Trump, uh, kind of misstepped, uh, uh when the, uh, issue of um, African Americans and minorities uh, came up because clearly, you know, the Trump campaign is trying to make inroads in the African American community, in particular, talking about uh, criminal justice reform. But when he got that question and he brought up Black Lives Matter and said, my first glimpse of, and look at uh, Black Lives Matter is people chanting pigs in a blanket talking about uh, cops. You know, the, the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, slogan movement has really cut across all racial, uh, ethnic, uh, and demographic lines. I mean, you can't walk it through neighborhoods uh, uh, in, in many parts of the country without seeing Black Lives Matter uh, signs. And I, I think Trump really undercut whatever efforts uh, his campaign was making to reach out to African Americans uh, by dismissing the entire Black Lives Matter movement. I thought that was a misstep uh, by him. And just one other point about um, the Hunter Biden stuff, because, you know, if you notice just when he brought it up, and this was, you know, what they were hoping was going to be a knockout blow for them or a knockout punch, at least, uh, at Biden. Biden was able to turn it back with a little help from Welker on Trump's taxes and put Trump on the defensive talking about taxes. And he starts talking about how, oh, that $750 was prepaid and I really paid a lot more. Uh, of course, then he had to explain why he hasn't released them. And uh, I think it, it, uh, it definitely muffled the, um, uh, the impact of what Trump was trying to do by raising the uh, uh, Hunter Biden stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, on the Black Lives Matters point, I, I agree with you. And, and when I was watching it, my reaction was uh, this president has been living in a bubble. Um, and, um, you know, he is listening to uh, his, uh, you know, right wing advisors who are feeding him, uh, you know, frankly, a lot of propaganda about 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 this movement. Um, and, you know, we've heard it all before that it is a Marxist Leninist movement, which uh, I think they mm -hmm. uh, I don't know exactly how they get to that. But we heard that from Matt Schlapp, for example. Don't you remember our... when we had Matt Schlapp on the podcast? Yeah, that he was yeah, yeah. You guys have to I, suffer I, through I, Matt Schlapp? I'll have to go listen to that. <laughs> yeah. That's painful. Yeah, right. But, uh, you know, I think there was a lot of that tonight uh, from him. And I think it, you know, harder in some ways for a president um, who, um, you know, they do live in bubbles. And this one, I think, in particular, uh, we have time for last thoughts from everybody. So uh, last thoughts on the debate and uh, and where things go from here uh, over the next 12, really now 11 days. Uh, why don't we start with you, Susan? 
you know, look, Dan, a, Joe Biden came into this with a lead, whether it was, you know, eight points, nine points, 10 points. Uh, and Donald Trump is the one who, in fact, was the challenger tonight and needed to do something to change the dynamic. It's very hard for an incumbent president who's behind by something like this, absent some, you know, earth shattering external event. That's what happened four years ago in the form of, you know, then FBI Director Jim Comey's intervention on October 29th, 2016, after the final debate with Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump. You know, Trump didn't save himself uh, uh, in any significant way tonight. That's what uh, he needed to do. That probably wasn't possible anyways. It's hard to envision anyone, uh, you know, really changing their mind because of anything that was said tonight. And, and another major difference, of course, from four years ago is something like 48 million Americans have already voted in this election. So, uh, you know, your your potential audience is even smaller in, in that respect uh, than it was before. So, you know, I imagine this is not going to go down in history uh, as the, one of the more memorable presidential debates. Uh, Donald Trump, bottom line, needed to come in here and either force Biden to make a terrible mistake or somehow transform the American public's view of him. That neither was really realistic. Biden uh, held his own against Trump. Uh, and in this case, a tie goes to the guy who comes in with a 10-point lead. Tim, what do you think? And, and I'm sure you're looking at the, uh, at, at the polling closely. Yeah. Uh, have you seen uh, any movement? I mean, this has been a remarkably stable race. Are you seeing anything at all uh, that 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 is um, changing uh, the the nature of the race, and uh, that might uh, continue to change based on what you saw tonight in this debate? Yeah, just I'll, I'll get to the polls at the end. Two one second things, one sentence things on the debate that I just wanted to mention. Biden's line, well, Biden's best line of the night, where was when he said uh, to Trump, "I think you're confused. I'm Joe Biden, and I beat all those guys that you're trying to compare me to." Um, that is a good message for him with the voters that I'm about to talk to about in the polls. Uh, my final pet peeve is we're now through three debates and we didn't talk about Lafayette Square, and and I think that Trump's Trump benefits from this bias of he's been such an outlier in his horrible actions over the course of the presidency. You can't get to everything that he's done. And to have three debates without talking about uh, uh, an action that would have been the most unconscionable action of any of the other presidencies in my lifetime, uh, I think it's frustrating. Uh, as far as the polls are concerned, um, you know, look, uh, the voters that we talk to who are still undecided, um, most of them are leaning Biden, but are wor were worried about him. Like they were watching these debates because they, they had bought into the old mental acuity dementia line from the Trump camp and from Fox. And, and I think they were looking for a reason to vote for him or, or a reason to you know, stay home. And, and so I think that he acquitted himself fine with those undecided voters. And so while he might not have kept the pedal to the metal tonight, um, I just it's hard for me to imagine a big tick back. We're seeing in our internal polls you know, Biden's up narrowly in all these key states, um, a little closer for my comfort. I wish he was up 10 in all these states. I don't think that's it. Our, our polls have him up about four, five, six across Arizona, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, uh, only about two or three in Florida, actually. So uh, in theory, if there's a if there's a pushback to Trump uh, after this debate, um, you know, we could be in for uh, a neck and neck race. But um, Biden's got a little room. Yes, final thoughts. Yeah, I think, uh, look, um, I, I, you know, there was no clear winner here. Uh, if anything, on point scoring, I would, you know, probably give a, a small edge to Biden. But let's remember, I think most pundits uh, like us uh, gave the debates uh, 2016, uh, scored it for Hillary, and, and, and Trump still won. Um, so I don't think that the debates, this debate is going to be decisive. I think that the Trump people have one play left, and that's the Hunter Biden stuff. And I think you're going to hear a lot about it next week. And, um, you know, we started out talking about this guy, Tony uh, Bull. Uh, 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 Bob Alinsky, um, I think you're going to see him all over the news next week, certainly in conservative media. It might seep into uh, uh, other news organizations as well. And uh, Again, well, I think that's I, the only I, got Yeah, I, I, I raised uh, on the front end before the debate, I, I raised the uh, question of whether Tony Bob I'm not sure I'm 
pronouncing that right, uh, is going to be <laughs> a household yeah. name. He, uh, I, I don't think he is going to be a household name, is my guess. Um, and uh, a lot of people won't be able to pronounce his name. Apparently, I can't. But <laughs> in any event, uh, well, thanks all of you, Susan Glasser, Tim Miller, uh, Isakoff, as always, uh, for joining us tonight. And uh, uh, everybody, uh, stay with Yahoo News and Skullduggery through the election and beyond. And have a good evening.